Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to Immunology Lesson and this is part 2 of our discussion on immune cells and organs. The cardiovascular system includes cells and organs involved in our circulation. Now, when you think about immune organs, in many textbooks, the organs of our cardiovascular system are rarely emphasized as part of our immunity. There may be good reasons for that, but in my interpretations of recent literature, it should be discussed as part of our immunity. I think our circulatory system and immune system are interlinked. One premise for me to think that way is the role of what's called cardiac mast cells. So this is a type of cells found in your heart. So cardiac mast cells, they produce uh, growth factors called VEGF A and C. So that's vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. Uh, this stuff protects the heart against uh, ischemia. Um, ischemia is when your heart struggles to get good blood supply. Um, at the same time, these cardiac mast cells also release immune mediators like TNF-alpha, tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and granzyme B, which is a protease that can be cytotoxic to pathogens. So that's just one example why I believe our cardiovascular organs are part of our immune system. Another system is MPS or mononuclear phagocyte system. Um, or oh, by the way, I'll put the links to these papers on my webpage where I put these videos later so you can check them out. So mononuclear phagocyte system is a network of reticular fiber and some of the phagocytes you have learned in the last episode. So here's how I think about mononuclear phagocyte system. We have connective tissues all over our body. Uh, between the cells in these connective tissues, we have gaps. Within those gaps, there are networks of what's called reticulin or reticular fibers. So think of these networks as mesh of structures like fishing nets. But this fishing net consists of strings of proteins called reticular fibers. Now, distributed on this net, we have phagocytes. So these phagocytes act as sentinels. I mentioned sentinels a couple of times in the last episode. So imagine sentinels like garrisoned soldiers on castle wall. Uh, these soldiers, they don't go out roaming around to find an enemy. They wait until the enemy comes close to the wall and then they attack the enemy. So phagocytes on this reticular fiber network behave like that. So they don't roam around the circulatory system, they stay relatively stationary and they attack pathogens when the pathogens are nearby. So that's what sentinels are. So mononuclear phagocyte system is those sentinels plus the network of reticular fiber. Now connected to our cardiovascular system is what's called the lymphatic system. Uh, it is made up of lymphatic vessels and or at times just called lymphatics and along those vessels, we have lymph nodes and organs as well. So our blood fluid travels to our pulmonary system from the heart to the lungs. There you have exchange of gases and then the fluid flows to blood capillaries. Um, these blood capillaries then release the fluid into our organ tissues so, so that our tissues can get oxygen or nutrients. Okay, now, most of this fluid in our tissues, it will go back into the blood capillaries, around 80-85% of the total volume. The remaining 15-20% to of this fluid will be absorbed by another type of capillaries called lymph capillaries. So when that happens, the fluid enters the lymphatic system. The lymphatic capillaries are connected to lymphatic vessels and those vessels are connected to um, lymph nodes. So in our body, we have hundreds of lymph nodes, at least. Um, you can think of them as military checkpoints. So in these military checkpoints, you can find soldiers, which are the immune cells that we talked about last episode. Now, beside lymph nodes, you can also find lymphoid nodules. So lymphoid nodules are larger. Um, well, uh, two things. One, they are larger than lymph nodes, 
generally speaking. And secondly, they are often more encapsulated, meaning that they've got more tissue layers surrounding them. And then you have your lymphoid organs. Lymphoid organs are like large military bases. So examples of lymphoid organs are adenoids, tonsils, thymus, spleen, and bone marrow. Now, lymphoid organs are of two categories, primary and secondary. You only need to remember the two primary lymphoid organs, the bone marrow and thymus. Once you commit that to memory, other lymphoid organs that you come across in your reading can be considered secondary lymphoid organs. Primary lymphoid organs produce the immune cells. So it's like primary military bases where soldiers are born and raised. So this raising of the immune cells is called naive maturation. Naive maturation is different than what occurs in the secondary lymphoid organs, which is called antigen-driven maturation. So here's the difference. Uh, for naive maturation, the immune cells develop in the absence of antigen. We'll talk more about antigen in the next episode. For now, just think of antigen as pathogen molecules. So remember that, yeah? In naive maturation, cells develop in the absence of antigen. The immune cells that are raised in naive maturation is called naive cells. The naive cells then uh, move to the secondary lymphoid organs. In the secondary lymphoid organs, the cells undergo antigen-driven maturation where the immune cells develop in the presence of antigens. So that's the basic of it. Naive cells are like naive soldiers who are raised but have not yet seen the enemy. So these naive soldiers then got moved to the secondary military bases where they are weaponized and trained to see the enemy. So in other words, in the secondary lymphoid organs, the immune cells become fully activated. Bone marrow, of course, is not just the organ that generates immune cells. It generates all blood cells. The term for that generation of blood cells is hematopoiesis. And the cells generated at this stage is called hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs. A way to recognize HSCs in our samples is through the detection of proteins called CD34 and CKIT. So those are the... Um, what do you call it? Uh, molecular markers. So these guys are precursors to all the immune cells we've talked about. And in the context of immunity, bone marrow is also an important site for B cell maturation. Now, the maturation of B cells and other precursor cells, they are directed by signaling molecules. And those signaling molecules are called colony stimulating factors. Another technical name for signaling molecules is cytokines. So cytokines have different sizes, they come from different cellular sources, uh, they target principally certain cells. Uh, by that, it doesn't mean the cytokines target only those cells. Cytokines can affect multiple cells. It's just that the principal targets or the main targets of the cytokines can be uh, quite specific. And that specific targeting can induce the maturation of certain cell population. So for example, um, the cytokine called GMCSF, which we encountered early on in the last episode, it can target uh, myeloid stem cells. And that stimulates the cell to become a variant of macrophages like monocytes. The other primary lymphoid organ is called thymus, so it's crucial for T cell maturation. So remember that one, bone marrow is for B cell maturation, thymus is for T cell maturation. So T cells in thymus are called thymocytes. So once they mature into naive T cells, they'll move to secondary lymphoid organs. There is a genetic disorder called DeGeorge syndrome. Patients with DeGeorge can't produce T cells. So it affects around one in 4,000 babies. So I'm not aware if there's a cure to reverse it, to reverse the gene deletion that causes DeGeorge. But, you know, I pray that with genetic editing techniques, that will change soon, inshallah. But in the meantime, our options are transplanting new thymus into the patients or just manage the symptoms to compensate for the T-cell deficiency. So human body has around 500 lymph nodes and they are distributed throughout our lymphatic system, localizing along lymphatic vessels. 
Their development is influenced by cytokines such as um, LT alpha beta 2. So the way we know this is animal models that can't synthesize these molecules don't develop lymph nodes. The lymphatic fluid comes into the lymph nodes through the afferent vessels. So that fluid contains cells that bring along with them antigen. Uh, we call them antigen presenting cells. So in the lymph nodes, the fluid goes through passages called sinuses. So the fluid goes through subcapsular sinus, then trabecular sinus, then medullary sinus. And the fluid eventually exits through efferent vessels. Traveling through these sinuses, the cells in the fluid will encounter naive immune cells who live in these nodes. So now, you've got two groups of cells to keep straight in your mind. So one is the cells in the fluid, the antigen presenting cells. Two is the naive immune cells who reside in the lymph nodes. So the antigen presenting cells carry antigens. So traveling through these sinuses, they will show or present the antigens to the naive immune cells. So this event is called antigen presentation. You got that? I'll teach you more about antigen presentation next time. For now, um, just focus on the fact that the antigen presentation will activate the naive immune cells in, and make them fully weaponized and, and ready for battle. So that maturation process is what we mean by antigen-driven maturation. Another secondary organ is the spleen, which can be divided into two pulps, or actually more accurately, the parenchyma of the spleen, the functional tissue of the spleen, it can be divided into two pulps. One is the red pulp and two is the white pulp. The red one consists of tissue passages like sinus called sinusoids that have um, red blood vessels. The white pulp, which is what we are more interested in, it has white blood cells. Um, these white blood cells, these immune cells, mediate or get involved in adaptive immunity against uh, especially blood infection. The anatomy of spleen segregates B and T cells, so creating like separate operating zones. And they are created in such a way that helps the B and T cells to interact effectively with antigen presenting cells. And that interaction consequently helps with the adaptive response. The movement of B and T cells in the spleen are supported by cytokines such as CXCL13 for B cells and CCL19 and 21 for T cells. And lastly, not all our immune tissues are big and encapsulated. We have immune tissues that is associated with our skins, our epithelia, our mucosa. So they are non-encapsulated, meaning they are not surrounded with layers of structural fiber tissues like what you would see on lymph nodes. A key example for the system is malt, which is mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. Now, beside having immune cells, Malt also have resident microbes on them. And that raises interesting questions, right? Like, how come our immune cells don't attack these microorganisms? So, inshallah, you'll find the answer in the future, in the future episodes throughout this course. Okay, I'll stop here. But don't worry if you feel a bit lost in some part of this lesson. So that's normal, especially if this is the first time you go this deep into immunology. So go over those part again and and then cross refer them with the textbooks and other online resources all right keep on reading keep on learning barakallahu li wa lakum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah